Mike Milbury is brought to you today by Shaw's and Star Market, Perfecting the Art of Fresh, by findmassmoney.gov, and by John Sewer, the name to know when your drains don't flow. And he joins us on the Harbor One Hotline this morning. Hey, Mike. I was wondering what I'd ask for Christmas, but now I know, a tongue scraper. Tongue scraper. Yeah, cheap. Six bucks on Amazon, Mike. Nice. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Curtis was Curtis went home early to take care of his son, but uh, he was a little worked up when it comes to Southwest Airlines and their new policy, which grants an additional free seat to those who are obese. You know, he's going to have to get over it. I mean, yeah. anybody that has to go home to parent in the middle of his show, working show, I mean, he's going to have to toughen up a little. <laughs> so is the kid. <laughs> well, I'm obese, so I love it. <laughs> I'm more, like I said, I'm morbidly obese yeah. in the eyes of society. I think do you, you, do you expect that accommodation everywhere you go? I, I now, now the Southwest Airlines is yeah, doing that. Yeah, I think it should be. In, so, so, uh, so every business mm-hmm. should accommodate you. La- well, not me, larger because, people. Uh, larger people. Obese. Uh, rather than expecting that the person mm-hmm. themselves might have some personal accountability. Well, the, part of it is the eating, but the other part is I was born this way, Greg. Uh-huh. I guess my dad was big. Uh-huh. You know, the extra room is good for you, Wiggy. You mm-hmm. know, the good news is you get the extra seat. The bad news is it's Southwest Airlines. That's true. <laughs> I mean, but for the, the saving the money, yeah. I'll fly Southwest. Yeah. Um, they could have a new slogan, which could be fly Southwest when you're as big as the entire region in the uh, country. <laughs> uh. <laughs> When you're, if you're as big as the Southwest, fly our airline. Mm. All right. Well, Michael, uh, you end up with a point last night. Are you alarmed at all by a uh, overtime loss for the Boston Bruins? I'm not alarmed. I mean, I think they're they're falling into the area that they should be, and the biggest problem now seems to be, you know, scoring some goals. I mean, they're 18th, I think, in the league in total goals scored for. Uh, we probably saw that coming with the absence of Bergeron and Krejci, uh, but it's a uh, you know, it, it really speaks to to some of their needs, and they've been a little sloppy around the front of the net. Let's face it, McAvoy and is out last night. Zach is out last night, and that that certainly is going to be a little more difficult to overcome. But um, for me, I think Swayman has just become one of the top goaltenders in the league. There's just no doubt about it. I, I think if you guys watched the game on. TNT last night, uh, I think Henrik Lundqvist did a great job of breaking down Swayman's strengths. He's quick. He's aggressive. Mm. He's upright. You know, he, it's, it was a good point by him. He always seems to be just straight backed, and the, he fills the net, so it's it's just almost impossible to see daylight behind it. I mean, the goals that were scored against him were were magnificent goals and great goals to beat anybody. But I thought he was the star of the game and. You can see how economical he is. His vision's good. His anticipation's good. And so well, the point I'm coming to is if they have other holes and they have other holes, I don't think they can afford to have the two goaltender system. Mm, I mean, okay. I know we're trending toward that, but you can use that in the regular season. You want to have your top goaltender play 60 or so games and, and give them a rest with 20 others. But when you get to the playoffs, you're going to want to go with your, your best goaltender almost every game, or every game, not even almost every game. And I think for me, as good as Allmark is, I think Swayman is the guy for the future, and I think you have to start dangling this guy out there. There are a number of teams that need goaltending help, and, and uh, it's a valuable commodity, and I think I think they should start to aggressively start to look at making a move in that direction. And you would say that that Linus is the odd man out. He's the guy that you make the move on. Well, I think he's a little bit older. I mean, making a little bit more money, but not much. <clears throat> and I just think it's, you know, I like the I like the attitude of Swayman. I like his focus. Um, and there's nothing wrong with Olmark. I can say he seems to to be a little bit of a different duck. But you know, for me, I put my I put my money on Swayman, and I would I would certainly look at trying to find. A, an up and coming centerman, or if you want to start talking about another defenseman, that's you can always use one. And and uh, Swayman for me now has put himself in the elite amongst goaltenders in the National Hockey League. 
Mike, last week when we talked, I said the identity of the Bruins team, in my opinion, was that they're young and they've got a lot of young guys stepping up. We saw starting on Saturday and now last night, Morgan Geeky stepping up. And yeah, he's been in the league since 2020, 2019, uh, but he's new for this Bruins team. H- how important will he be? And do you think he'll have a, a big part of this team moving forward? It's a good question. I, I, you know, I don't have a great handle on him. Last night he had a terrific game. They talked about him on the broadcast extensively. And for good reason, he was. It looked like, given the extra ice time because of the absence of Zaka, it looked like he was ready to to step up and, you know, take a little bit more control. <clears throat> Excuse me. And and I think that's that's a great sign. I'd like to see more of it. I just haven't seen enough of it up to this point. I and mean, he's been he's been useful, but last night was a, at a different level. Can you keep that up? Good question. Did Jim Montgomery make the right decision when he made Matthew Patra a healthy scratch the other night and then limited his playing time the next game in the in the third period? I don't think that's the way you're going to draw the best out of a young player like that, to put him on a yo-yo and just up and down, up and down. That's, that's tough. It's tough enough as a young player. You know you're going to make your mistakes and uh, you feel bad enough about them. But when you... When you get scratched, it's a, it's really a public shaming in some ways. And uh, you know, he's, I guess he could, he can get used to it. But it's for me, that's not the way I'd handle it. And he's been talking about having teaching moments. That's a tough teaching lesson. Mike, yeah, that, that's the thing that we talked about. I think that was the thing with Cassidy and DeBrusque. And you know, when you look at a player like that and you have high expectations for him, and you know, he's a high draft pick. I don't know, and then you don't have the same leadership in the locker room. I don't know how players in the locker room, I, I feel like I would view that in kind of a negative way if my head coach is sitting one of our young players that we have uh, high expectations for early in the season rather than letting him kind of see his way through some of the rough wa- waters as a young player. So it's better for him to work through it. Yeah. Than publicly shaming it. Yeah, because mentally now, you know, the kid knows like, okay, the coach is giving me a little bit of a leash that I can, you know, get through some things. Would you do we say it's the same as sitting Mac Jones? No, because I see Mac Jones <laughs> if you sat Mac Jones week seven of his rookie year, I and then I was I would have a little bit of issue, especially if the first six weeks he wasn't like that bad because prior to this, did we hear anything negative about Potter? No. Mike, no, no, we ha- no, we haven't, and he's been uh, he's been fun to watch, and I think they they should have known when they kept him on the roster that he was going to have some moments, good and bad, and that they were going to have to work through it. And I think I mentioned this before. I saw Montgomery at a function early in uh, early on, and he had been playing Pope on the third to fourth line. You're just not going to you're not going to develop a player into a top six forward playing them with guys that are on the bottom six. So. I mean, for me, he's part of the future. And if you're going to play kind of hardball with the future, you might get stung. So I, I, I'd be, I'd be careful if I was Montgomery. And I, you know, I'm a little tired of his tinkering with lines. Get your best players out there at the right times. Get your checkers out there at the right times, and let it roll. I mean, nobody's got the answer by just rolling dice with different combinations. Mike, yeah, when it comes to the tinkering, like you would have thought that he might have learned a lesson in the playoffs. Well, exactly, and uh, he didn't tinker enough in goal. That was one problem he had, but, you know, I think uh, he may have learned a lot of lessons, but this is a whole different team, and they're they're finding their level. I don't think anybody expected them to be as good as they were coming out of the gate, and now we found some cracks maybe in the foundations, and and they're going to have to find a way to patch them up. Mike, you know what I see this as, and I've seen coaches do this before, and I'd like to get your thought as from a guy who was a coach and a player. Sometimes I feel like, when the team's not doing what they want them to do, they tend to make an example out of the young guy. Um, is this something that he that Montgomery could be doing to say, like, even though it's the other guys, I'm going to use the young guy as the example? Is that something where that this could be what he's doing? I don't agree what, with it. To sit Marshan? No, no, no. But I, I, there are times when it could be like maybe your your veteran players aren't doing the same thing, but rather than sit one of them, you use the young guy as the example, which I don't agree with. Have you ever yeah, seen? It's much easier to pick on the young guy. I mean, it's it's you know you're certainly not going to be benching Marshan as Greg just mentioned or 
Bergeron last year. It's just just not going to happen. But to start picking on the young guys is to, you know, reveal maybe some of your own flaws, not just the young players. I mean, I, I think you have to find a way to get around that. And I, I agree with you 100%, Wiggy, that just, you know, because the guy makes one mistake and you, you staple him to the bench for the next game, um, it's a it's the wrong message to send. I and mean, you should be should be able to get by it as a coach as much as you can as a player. Uh, Mike, Saturday night the Bruins square off with the Rangers. Uh, last time they played the Rangers, the Rangers ended up winning 7-4 to four in a game that everybody thought would be an absolute slugfest. It was instead a scoring fest. Um, the way the Bruins have been, I don't want to use the word struggling, but they haven't been scoring at a, at a high rate as we would like. Like, are they just going to get pumped by the Rangers here? Like this is, I'm I'm starting to get worried that they are, they have overperformed to this point because the goaltenders are so good. But like when the cream starts rising to the top, like they are going to kind of fall behind a little bit, and they're not going to be in that one two seed conversation. Well, the Rangers have become a very very good team. They they lost a couple nights ago in surprising fashion, but they 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 have. I thought they were on the move last year, and now with Peter Laviolette behind the bench, I think they're in a much better position to start to contend. Um, so you're going to, you know, when when the Bruins start playing some of these better teams, and the schedule's been kind of quirky, it's been, you know, up and down, and long gaps, but I think they're going to get a little bit, a little bit more engaged in the next couple of weeks. But one of the one of these teams is the Rangers, and by the way, it's a night where the the lunch bell gang, my era, is going to be honored. I'm kind of looking forward to seeing Ooh. some guys I haven't seen in about 30 years. Oh, all right. What are they doing? Uh, I don't know. They're going to just kind of roll us out on the ice, the old fat guys, and say hello. <laughs> are they uh, are they providing two seats for some of you? Um, they're providing a lot of things. They've been, <laughs> yeah, yeah. They put them in the southwest section. <laughs> All right, last one from me. Were you surprised that Craig Berube was fired? You know, I really like Craig Berube. I think he's a great, he's a terrific guy. He's done a terrific guy's job as a coach. Won a championship unexpectedly against the Bruins, as we all know. Oh, it still and I, I believe that uh, every coach has a, a timeline, some much longer than others, Bill Belichick or others, but I, I do believe that sometimes – Changing the voice is, is important, and it does rattle everybody and does put everybody attention. You could look at the Edmonton Oilers who made that kind of a decision, and they're reaping the the dividends of that right now. So uh, I don't – I'm not close enough to know the situation. I know both guys, Doug Armstrong, the general manager, and Craig himself, and both good guys, and I know it wouldn't have been done lightly, and, and I think Berube will find himself with another job before too long. All right. Last time that I will speak with you before the holidays. So Merry Christmas, Happy New Year, all of those things. And I'll talk to you again in 2024. Mike yeah, Palmer. I'm looking forward to my tongue scraper. Uh, <laughs> Courtney has a gift coming. You have a gift for Mike? You got Bill yeah. Belichick a gift. I, 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 yeah, I can Where, get uh, a gift. Would you like to come to Courtney's party that she's having, Mike? Yeah. Um, I think it's next week. Well, where's the party? Uh, Christmas oh. Eve Eve in South Boston. Oh. So you didn't get an invite either. Welcome <laughs> no, to the I club, don't. Mike. <laughs> he didn't get one either. He oh, doesn't man. live in Boston. I know. <laughs> Neither does your friend who lives in She's New York. She's going to be in Boston uh, yeah. with her family. All right. We're just, uh, the, the, the list keeps growing when it, it comes to those that were uninvited. <laughs> no No Mike Milbury, no Devin McCourty, no oh Ty Losh. Yeah. Yeah. It's going to no take some time to get over this, Courtney. Uh. All right, Mike. Thank you. That's Mike Milbury. We will be right back.